Uh, if you have your Bibles, I would like for you please to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Just like this morning, this is going to be the only place I'm going to ask you to turn for the entirety of our sermon this morning. I don't like to make a practice of reading long text or even one chapter in the course of a sermon. But I do think tonight it's important for us, especially with a smaller group, to sit back and think about our story. Um, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Have you ever looked back on your life at a sin that you've committed and felt shame? or sadness that you had experienced that or done or made that choice. Um, many of us, or at least I know I have, look back years, even decades, to things that we've done in the past, knowing that we have repented of those things, that God has forgiven us, and yet when we think about that action or something that we have done in the past, we still can't help but feel some sense of, of shame or sadness over what we have done. And so I think that sometimes we, we feel that way, and I wonder uh, if time diminishes that. I wonder if over time, you know, time heals all wounds, they say. Does that shame ever go away? Is that shame repressed? And then I think about someone like Adam. Adam, the Bible, te the Bible tells us Adam lived for 930 years. And I think about after all those decades, even centuries, did Adam ever think back to the garden? Did he ever think about that intimate relationship that he had with God, that he got to walk with him in the cool of the day and talk with the creator of the universe? I wonder if he thought back in the middle of those fields as he was grubbing those thistles and trying to raise that, that livestock, of how well he had it in the garden and how his sin had ruined everything. I wonder if he ever looked back and thought about that moment he was there with Eve and Eve had been tempted and she brought him the fruit and said, here, eat this. I wonder if he ever looked back with shame and disgust after what he had done, even after so much time had passed. And although the term sin never occurs in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us explicitly, especially Paul in Romans, that this was the act of mankind that separated man from God. Not only did it alienate Adam from God, but it alienated all of mankind from God. And so you and I are the recipients of that disgrace and of that sin, even though it took place thousands and thousands of years ago. Genesis 3 does not give us a snapshot of one man's sin, but of the entirety of mankind's depravity and fallenness away from our Lord and our Savior and the God that created us. And so sin is not just an alienation of God from man, but also of man to man. And so I would like for us tonight to look at Genesis chapter 3 and read this story and see how can we learn something from sin and how can we keep ourselves from making those types of mistakes that we don't look back years or decades and say, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't have made that choice. I knew better and I still did wrong. And although the term sin is never used in Genesis chapter 3, I think this chapter teaches us more about sin in our lives than probably any other chapter in the Bible. And so I would like for us to look at this chapter in depth tonight. Let's look at the first two verses, if you will, of Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say to you, Shall you not eat of the tree of the garden? And so here we see in verses 1 and 2 that sin is crafty. Temptation comes in all types of forms and facets. And here Satan approaches Eve with a question. And so sin can even come to us in the terms of a crafty question, trying to trip us up into doing something that transgresses what God has explicitly told us what not to do. And so that comes with us today in all types of facets and forms. I mean, what about commercials? I mean, you and I are constantly bombarded day after day with different ways to sin, even in watching TV with commercials, or maybe the TV shows or the movies in and of themselves. One of the things I'm trying to do in my life is to look at the music that I sing or the music that I was raised with. Uh, I was singing Linda on My Mind by Conway Twitty. And Brittany was in the other room. She said, is that really an appropriate song? <laughs> I said, well, not really. And so I've got to start listening to the songs I've been singing my entire life that I was raised with because of the message that's behind them. Because Satan is trying to get us in all types of ways. Now, what about the input that we have from our friends or our family or our coworkers or even our political or religious leaders? Satan is trying all the time in all different types of ways to get us tripped up into sin just like he did with Eve here in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. 
And so sin lies to us. Satan lies to us and tries to make us think that we can't trust God. You see, sin here comes from a distrust in God. Adam and Eve didn't trust God's warning. The next chapter, Cain didn't trust God's idea of what a real sacrifice or what a pure sacrifice was supposed to look like. And so he gave vegetables instead of the lamb that God must have requested for him to be so upset with Cain's offering. And so oftentimes sin comes from a level of distrust. When we sin today, it comes from doubt and distrust that we have in God. God says, this is what you need to do. And just like Adam and Eve in the garden, we distrust Him and think, no, nah, I think I've got a better way. You know, God says that you should save yourself in purity for marriage. We think, no, no, I think I've got a better way for that. Or God says that you should be in, in a man of integrity or a woman of integrity when it comes to your finances and the way you, you treat other people with your money or your time. And we think, yeah, but we can get ahead if we, we fudge some things here, we, we do some things here. There's, there's different ways that we can save a dollar or two. What if it hurts somebody else? And so what it comes from is a distrust in what God has told us. He's trying to make us a holy individual, and yet we convince ourselves by distrusting what God has told us that we can have a better life, a more fulfilling life, that we can have greater pleasure in sin, even though God tells us that's not the case. And so just like Adam and Eve, we choose to distrust what God has told us, and we put more faith and trust in what Satan is trying to give us. You see, I think about a young child or something in the window of a burning house. You know, and normally jumping three stories out of a house would make no sense. But if the building is on fire and there are people down below that catch you, they need to jump out of the house. And it might be scary at first to see that great gulf. I mean, I don't like being 10 feet off the ground, let alone 30, three stories up, 30 feet. But if God tells us that's the best thing in our life to trust Him and jump, we've got to do that sometimes. And too many times we allow Satan to convince us, just like he did with our forefathers and our foremother, here to trust him rather than to trust God. Let's look at verse 6 of our text tonight. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. You see, sin never seems as vile as it really is. And so we've got to be assertive and not be passive. You see, if Eve would have thought to herself, I'm not going to sit here, I'm not going to look at this fruit, I'm not going to even ponder doing this in my mind, I'm, I'm getting out of here. You know, I, I told Brittany not too long ago that if a situation never arises where a woman hits on me, I'm going to run. I'm just going to run. And she was like, you're just going to get up and run? Yes, I'm just going to run. Like wherever I am, from church building or restaurant, I'm just going to get up and I'm just going to run. And uh, that's the way we've got to be with sin. I mean, that's, I mean if, if Eve would have said to herself, God told me that I cannot do this, I'm not even going to think about it for a minute, she would have been fine. But Satan planted that seed in her head. Our Ladies' Day speaker yesterday talked about planting seeds and reaping what we sow. She allowed Satan to plant that seed in her mind and her heart. And she sat there and she looked at that fruit. And she looked at it, and she thought about it, and she pondered over it. And she said, you know what, it's pretty. It looks like it'd be tasty. It really couldn't be that bad, could it? And so she rationalized and she reasoned in her mind while it was okay. Isn't that what we do with sin all the time? If she would have been assertive, if she would have been active with resisting sin, she would have been able to walk away as soon as Satan planted that seed. But she didn't allow that to do that in her life. She, she waited. She thought about it. She, she pondered over it. And when we do that with sin, we're going to find ourselves more often than not being tripped up in a snare. I think about how we face this reality all the time. One of the ways I think about this in our culture is with drinking. Ten people die in the United States every day as a result of alcohol causes. And on average, the person that dies, their life is cut short by an average of 30 years. I mean, think about that epidemic. I mean, I'm not trying to be political, but we get so riled up over school shootings when a hundred times more, maybe even a thousand times more people are killed because of alcohol every year than because of guns. And that never gets mentioned. And yet, whenever you see a commercial on TV, it's a bunch of 20-year-olds who are fit and good-looking on a beach somewhere in the Caribbean, and they're all having a good time. But it's never presented like the, the young mother that was killed just a few months ago. Mother of four who had a premature baby who was in the NICU at the hospital. And she had been there all day, and she was coming home, and she was hit head-on by a drunk driver. And that young mother, a mother of four, left her husband and four young children, one in the NICU, because of alcohol. Oh, we don't put that on TV. That's not on the Bud Light commercials. 
The young girl who's 18 and thinks she's going to have a good time, and yet she's so drunk she can't even control herself or motor skills, and she's raped by somebody at college. We don't put that on, we don't put that on commercials, do we? Because that's not how sin likes to present itself. And so we've got to be sure that we're assertive with sin. Assertive with saying, no, I'm not even going to think about this for a moment because I know the danger. I know the destruction that can be caused. And when we see those things, we flee and we run. But so many times we find a way to rationalize it in our mind. Well, that's not going to be me. That's not going to happen to us. And so we allow peer pressure from wherever it might come from, sin ultimately and Satan, to allow ourselves to be swayed away from the gospel truth and from living a, a sober and holy life. You see, peer pressure is one of the most powerful things this world has to offer. It can be the biggest danger to you spiritually, or it can be the biggest help. The difference lies in who are your peers. You see, if your peers are your church family, peer pressure is a good thing. If your peers are those who are living in the world for sin and Satan, it's a bad thing. So be sure that your peers are those that are going to help you and not those who are going to help hurt you. Let's look at verses 8 through 10 of our text tonight. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. You see, sin causes us to have fear, shame, and guilt in the presence of God. And thus it changes our relationship with God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says that if we walk in the light as He's in light, His blood continues to cleanse us from all sins. I've talked to people so many times in counseling situations, and they tell me about the sin in their life and how they just feel like they're hopeless. And I say, how's your prayer life? And they say, not very good. Sometimes I ask, well, why do I think that is? I just feel too ashamed to talk to God about the things that I'm going through in my life. Maybe you've been there. I know I have. Where you just feel like you just messed up. So you're just almost too shameful to approach God. You see, sin changes that relationship we have. And that's the way Adam and Eve felt. They had a relationship with God where they talked to Him daily. And yet once they realized their sin, they felt too ashamed to be in the presence of God. You see, if we allow ourselves to have sin in our life, it changes the relationship. He no longer becomes, we no longer see him as that loving father who cares for us, but we see him as that angry God. And the Bible says that we should hold both the goodness and the severity of God. And it is a dangerous thing or a, a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. But not only does it change the relationship that we have with God, it changes the relationship that we have with those in this life. You see, Adam and Eve at that point, when God approached them, we're going to see a little bit later, their relationship becomes stressful. Because Adam goes from praising God for the helpmate that he has made to blaming her and saying, God, it was this woman that you gave me. She's the one that gave me the fruit. You see, the, the people that we're the closest to, when we allow sin to come into our lives and touch us, the people that we are with the most are going to be most affected. Our parents, our children, our church family, our siblings our grandchildren, when we allow sin to be in our life, the ones that we love the most and the ones that we're closest to are the ones that are going to be touched by the decisions that we make and the sin that we choose to have in our life. Just like Adam and Eve's relationship was put in a stressful way. How many marriages, families, businesses, churches have been damaged beyond repair because people allowed sin to fester in their lives and in their hearts? Let's look at verse 11 of our passage. Verse 11. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? Let's look at verses 12 and 13 also. The man said, The woman whom you gave to, me, to be with me, she gave me of the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And you see, God knows when we sin. There is no covering it up. God knows when we mess up. Psalm chapter 69 verse 5 says, O God, you know my folly. The wrongs that I have done are not hidden from you. Hebrews 4.13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who must give an account. I think the Hebrew writer was drawing a parallel between the garden in Genesis 3 and what he says in Hebrews 4 with naked and exposed. Jeremiah 16.17 says, For my eyes are on their ways, they are not hidden from me, nor is there iniquity concealed from my eyes? And so God knows when we sin, and that knowledge should keep us from sinning in the future. Because when we do sin, the 
the idea is to blame other people. In verses 12 through 13, we see that Adam tries to blame the woman. The woman tries to blame the serpent. But at the end of the day, when we allow sin to come to our lives, we may have been influenced by other people, and most of the time that is the case. But you always have a choice. You always have the right to say yes or no. And we can't pass that blame on anybody else. And so we have got to make a decision in ourselves that we're not going to blame others for our shortcomings because God is not going to allow that to happen. He's not going to allow us to pass the blame to someone else. We've got to make a choice. For those who have addictions, they say admittance is the first step. To say, I have a problem. It's the same way with sin. We've got to realize that the problems that we have spiritually are our choices and nobody else. And we're going to have to get those things in order if we're going to start living a faithful and a holy life towards God. Verses 14 through 19 talks about the consequences of sin. Let's read that together, 14 through 19. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and pain you shall eat all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of which you were taken you are dust, and to dust you shall return." All sin comes with consequences. God warned them that when they ate of that tree, they were going to die. No, they didn't die that day, but they, they started dying. The, the cells started to break down and decay, and death was imminent to them. From de- dust they were made, and from dust they were going to return. We see Genesis 3, sin has already started to tear apart the relationship between man and woman. When sin puts a strain on our relationships, we feel the weight and burden of those sins. I'm, as mentioned before, I think sin touches those who we are closest to, which of course if you're married, I believe that is your spouse. And so whenever we put ourselves in a sinful situation, not only are we putting ourselves in pain, but also those who are closest to us. In Genesis 4, we see that cycle continue as Cain killed his brother Abel because he sinned and was jealous of God, welcoming that sacrifice over his own. And all sin is directed towards God, but not all sins have the same consequences. Ultimately, those sins have the same consequences, but maybe not so in this life. And so we've got to be sure that we are making sure that we are are making sure we weigh the consequences of sin. Uh, Yes, you may sin, you may repent of those sins, but that doesn't mean that sin will be through with you. And so we've got to realize that there are sins that that can hurt us all the days of our lives, that can bring us shame and despair, even decades or even a lifetime after those things have even been forgiven by God Himself. And so we have to realize that we have to be sure that we're not finding ourselves in sin because we cannot fool ourselves. There will be consequences for all those things. The Bible tells us that that which is done in the darkness will be brought to the light. Let's look at verses 20 through 21, if you will. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. I think it's interesting here that right after God gives the cursings on the man and the woman for disobeying him, he blesses them. He blesses them with security in the form of clothing. Even after we sin, God looks to bless us even more than we deserve. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, we're told that Jesus was going to come and that He was going to be the Savior of the world, that He was going to save us from our sins. And so although we are vile and wretched, although we did not deserve it, Romans chapter 5 and 8, God loved us and sent us His Son. God has always tried to seek reconciliation and blessing with His people, but we have got to be sure that we are trying to get back towards that relationship with God. And the last three verses that we'll read tonight, Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. 
Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. And he drove, him out, he drove out the man, and the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And the biggest consequence of sin is that sin drives us out of God's presence. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us the reason that we are alienated from God is because we have sin in our life and God being holy cannot be in a relationship with someone who has sin which is why Christ had to come for our sins if we die while alienated from God and are covered with sin then we will spend eternity alienated from him in the fires of hell without relief that's why sin is such a big deal. It's not just, well, you know, we're Christians, so we've got to preach on sin every once in a while. Sin is the destroyer of mankind. Sin is a destroyer of souls. And if we're not careful, we can be lulled asleep by our culture. We can be lulled asleep by the, by the advancements of sin and Satan and think, well, you know, it's not, that's, just, that's just how it is these days. Well, that may be the case, but not for the Christian. We've got to be sure that our sights are set on heaven. Paul says, I've forgotten everything. I left all things behind striving towards that eternal goal of salvation. Paul says, I'm focused. And as Christians, we've got to be the exact same way. And so tonight is sin separating you from God. Sin is crafty. Sin lies to us. We've got to be assertive when it comes to resisting sin and not passive. Sin changes the relationships that we have with God and also with each other. God knows when we sin. We cannot blame others when we sin because we know that it is our fault. Sin has consequences. Sin affects others. Sin separates us from God. But thanks be to God, even after we sin, He looks to bless us. If we can learn all these things from the fall of mankind in Genesis 3, if they're so evident to us, then we ought to be extremely diligent to make sure that we don't have sin in our lives and that we have the precious blood of God cleansing us from our sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Sin doesn't have to rule our lives. When God was talking to Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, that very next chapter, He says, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is to is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Sin is crouching at the door, and it wants you. Peter says the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If we say, I'm good, Paul says, take heed lest you fall. We've got to realize that sin is crouching at the door, but thanks be to God that we can be forgiven. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says that we were washed, that we were sanctified, that we were justified. We can have that forgiveness. Acts 2.38 through repentance and baptism. We can put to death that old man of sin, Romans chapter 6, and we can live faithful lives with his blood continuing to cleanse us from all sin, 1 John 1.7. And if we resist the devil, James 4.7 says that he will flee us. And so we've got to make sure that we have been washed and that we have been forgiven. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you've never repented of your sins, confess that Christ is your Lord, and been baptized, immersed from mission of your sins, know this, sin will cause you to spend an eternity in hell where there is no relief and there are no second chances. And so if you're of the age of accountability and you know there's sin in your life, don't play with sin because it could cost you your soul. Respond to the gospel. If you're here tonight and you are a Christian, be sure that you're guarding your life because sin is looking at you and it wants you. And you've got to make a choice each and every day whose call you're going to answer, whether it's going to be the Lord's or whether it's going to be Satan's. And you've got to make that call each and every day and be sure you're making the right call. If you need the help of the congregation tonight, please come as we stand and as we sing.